Good morning, church. This is the day that the Lord has made and we will rejoice in it. It is such a joy to come together to worship God. As many times we come together, God is pleased with our praises and our thanksgiving. Normally he is pleased with our thanksgiving, he is also pleased with our fruit bearing life. These recent days God has been impressing upon my heart in the midst of the volatile world that we live in so much of wickedness is going on god wants us to bear fruit for him it is nothing but bearing the god's nature in our life god wants us to demonstrate his nature his divine nature through our living through our conversation through our doing so that the world will know that we are his disciples Jesus is talking about the sower sowing the seed in the good land and how it produces 30-fold, 60-fold and 100-fold. That is exactly the disciples life is. When we are listening to the word of God, actively living out the word of God, we will bear fruit which is 30-fold, 60-fold and 100-fold. It is a gradual increase and growth of our life demonstrating Christ as we are embedded with the word of God. Friends, this world is looking for Jesus. This world is looking for truth. Jesus is the truth and he has given us the truth. Even as we get soaked into the word of God, let's live out the word of God so that the fruit that we bear will reflect the divine nature of God. May I encourage you to demonstrate the divine nature of God wherever you are, in your workplace, in the schools, in your neighborhood, wherever you go. Let people experience the divine nature of God. With that, I want to welcome you to this worship service where Christ is the center of our worship. Even as we worship Him, tune our hearts to praise Him and thank Him. May we tell Him, Lord, will you also fill me with your divine nature? Fill me with your divine spirit. Fill me with your divine power so that the world around me will see you and will glorify your name. Let's sing together. Thus will I bless thee. 
Hebrews 4, 16 says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Father, we thank you for giving us your divine nature. Thank you for giving us your divine power. Thank you for giving us your divine promises. Father, I pray that you will empower us to live out the life that we have in Christ Jesus so that the world around us will know who you are and will worship you, will come to know you and will have a relationship with you, Lord. Lord, I pray that you will help us to be people who will continuously bringing forth that beautiful fruit of divine nature and help us to be a channel of blessing to people all around us, Lord Father. Father, even as we spend some more time listening to the word of God, I pray that you will speak to us. Father, I pray that help us to have an attentive ear, active heart of learning and living out what we hear so that abundant fruits will come out of our life. 
Thank you for the privilege of listening to your word. In Jesus precious name we pray. Amen. Friends, we continue to study the gospel of Mark and God has been talking to us in many many ways. Let's ask the Lord, Lord, not only we will have attentive ears but also we will have retentive mind and heart that will help us to activate our living that will demonstrate God's truth through our life. It's a privilege that we have brother Vijay Benjamin to come and share God's word with us. As he shares God's word, may we ask the Lord, Lord speak to me and help me to obey you. Brother Vijay Benjamin. Good morning church and welcome to this beautiful Sunday morning where we worship Christ our Lord and our savior. Imagine if Jesus were to come to your home what's the most important thing that will keep you busy imagine if you had one excuse to tell jesus to discouraging him from coming what would that be and if jesus came unannounced what will surprise or shock him the most keep thinking about these questions as we go along as we go along our study from the book of mark Let's look at the journey so far. As we began the book, we looked at the beginning of the gospel of the kingdom. And very quickly we realized that Mark is not wasting any time. He's talking about the kingdom and he's saying that the kingdom is here and now. And how missions is all about bringing heaven to earth instead of sending earthlings to heaven. The next week when we saw about the baptism of jesus we looked at the five relational dynamics for missions identifying with humanity awareness of the divine acknowledgement empowerment of the holy spirit the supernatural guidance of the holy spirit and the eminent victory over darkness we next saw how jesus called his first disciples and we looked at the call of god and our response and it was amazing to see how jesus chose ordinary and perhaps even the unqualified setting a precedent that the gospel and the kingdom is open to all as long as we obey the call and last week we had a wonderful message titled astonished and awakened where we looked at how going beyond astonishment we must look at obedience how there is a rebellious group of people and ironically it's called the church and how we need to unlearn to move from the darkness to light today as we gather to reflect on the transformation power of jesus we look at this portion of scripture where jesus goes to simon peter's house our focal passage is from the gospel of mark chapter 1 and verses 29 to 34 as we dive into this passage let's explore the profound impact of Christ's presence in our lives and in our homes let me read for you mark chapter 1 verses 29 to 34 as soon as they left the synagogue they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever and they immediately told Jesus about her so he went to her took her hand and helped her up the fever left her and she began to wait on them that evening after sunset the people brought together to Jesus all the sick and the demon possessed the whole town gathered at the door and Jesus healed many who had various diseases he also drove out many demons but he wouldn't let the demon speak because they knew who he was you know when we look at this particular incident of jesus going to simon peter's house it's very very amazing and today this message i have split into three things the first one is when jesus comes home let's look back you know last week we saw about what happened when jesus on the day of sabbath went to the synagogue and how he healed a demon possessed man and how there was a little you and cry about that while people were astonished 
they were not awakened. What Jesus did and what people saw, they were curious, but it did not lead them to the truth. In fact, many times it happens that curiosity can take us away from the truth. And so we find that when Jesus decides to come, you know, you must look at the language that Mark uses and you'll always find that Mark is always in a hurry. And he will use words like, as soon as they left, immediately. Right? And it always finds that, you know, when Mark is writing the gospel, there is a lot of movement. There's a lot of movement and a lot of speed. And that comes very, very clearly in the book of Mark. And so the first thing that Mark tells us is that as soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Peter, whose original name was Simon, Simon and Andrew not only brought their friends James and John home with them after church, but they also brought Jesus home. Now this is a good example for us to follow. And the idea here is this, don't leave Jesus at the church. Take him home with you and let him impact your life, your home, your daily life and all those who live under your roof. You know, many times we come to church, we have a wonderful service, we have a wonderful fellowship, but then as we leave, we put a full stop and saying this much and not anymore. And then it's time for us to go back to our normal lives. And that's why perhaps lives remain normal because we keep Jesus at a distance. We tell Jesus to be there and come no closer to us. We find in this particular verse there are two sets of brothers, James and John, Simon, Peter and Andrew. And they had abandoned earthly pursuits to follow Jesus, to pursue the kingdom of God that Jesus has been talking about. And on that day, in a sense, they got a front row experience of Jesus and his power. When you follow Jesus, you invite him to your home. You will get to a one-on-one, -on -one, a closer walk with Jesus. And you're going to see Jesus like never before. He may do amazing things in your life and the lives of others because of you. The question is, are you going to be having difficult times? Yes. But following Jesus is much better than walking away from Him. Think about it. What are some of the things that can prevent you and me from inviting Jesus to our homes, to our everyday lives? Well, there are many, many things that could do that, but here are the top five. And I would like to quickly take you through that. The top five reasons why or how we could prevent Jesus from coming to our home. Number one is unconfessed sin. Isaiah chapter 59 and verse 2 says, But your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. You know, unaddressed sin acts as a barrier to God's presence. In fact, we ourselves are not comfortable going to God. You know, sin stops us, prevents us from thinking about God, from wanting God in our lives. Because when God comes into our jurisdiction, and if sin is there, sin is going to feel very, very uncomfortable. You know, we saw that when Jesus healed the man at the synagogue, the demons came out and they were very uncomfortable because they were in the presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Sin becomes very uncomfortable. We become very uncomfortable when we have sin in our life and therefore we would rather prevent Jesus from coming into our homes and our lives than deal with our sin. And therefore it's important that we regularly confess and repent of our sins so that we maintain a closer walk and a relationship with Jesus so that Jesus can not only come to our home but he can dwell with us so that he becomes the Lord, the King of our lives. The second reason how we can prevent Jesus from coming into our lives is self-reliance and pride. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 18 says, Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Now there are many of us going around 
thinking that we can do it, we can handle it. We all like control because we think we can manage it. But trust me, the things that we can control, the things that we can actually manage are far, far less. And even for those, we need the grace of God. Perhaps the most simplest things that you and I do unknowingly is to breathe. But just imagine, if not for the grace of God, we wouldn't have that breath. Relying solely on one's abilities and achievements can and will lead us to pride. And pride prevents us from depending on God and His grace. Thirdly, neglecting spiritual practices. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 4 says, Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Jesus is our first love. But it's possible that over time, over continued negligence, with unconfessed sin, with pride in our heart, we can forsake our first love. You know, neglecting prayer, feeling uncomfortable in prayer, not spending time studying the Word of God. When fellowshipping or fellowship becomes a burden in our life, these are signs that we are leading towards spiritual apathy. We got to prioritize these practices. You know, many times we indulge in spiritual disciplines out of convenience and not out of conviction. But it's very important for us to understand that even if we don't feel like we got to kneel down and pray, even if we don't feel like we got to take the Bible and study it, even if we don't feel like we got to come together in the name of our Lord. Fourthly, lack of forgiveness. You know, we can receive the forgiveness, we can confess our sins and receive all the forgiveness that God can give us, but many times we are not graceful enough to forgive others. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16 says, But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. That's a very dangerous place to be, to think that God has forgiven us, but actually He has not because we have not extended that same grace to our fellow beings. Holding on to a grudge, refusing to forgive, hinders the flow of God's mercy in our lives. we got to embrace forgiveness as an essential aspect of Christian living. I mean, if a Christian cannot forgive, who can? A Christian is most qualified to forgive people because we have received that abundant forgiveness from God. We never earned it. We do not deserve it. But yet God forgives us. And therefore you and I need to go and forgive other people. And finally, we can prevent God from coming to our homes, into our lives, when we are distracted by the things of the world. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 and 16 says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love for the Father is not in them. Excessive focus on worldly pursuits, being driven by the things of the world, will surely divert our attention from God and He will not be the priority in our life. We got to strike a balance, keeping God as our priority and then keeping God in everything that we do. It's not wrong to have an ambition for your career, for your life, for your business, for your ministry. But the question is, is God part of that ambition? Is God leading that ambition? Anything without God can become dangerous. And that's something that we need to... So here are the five reasons that could probably prevent us from inviting Jesus to our home. Well, Jesus went to Simon Peter's house. He was thrilled about that. And not only he took his friends, he invited Jesus. And Jesus went to his home. But that's not the end of the story. In fact, the story just begins. We find that as when Jesus went there, we found that Simon and his brother and his friends, they made Jesus feel at home. You know, it's one thing to invite somebody home, but it's a completely different thing to make them feel at home. You know, often we use it like a cliche. We tell people, you know, feel at home, feel at home. But then there are restrictions on our guest and the restrictions do not make them feel at home. 
And we find how wonderfully, in the next couple of verses, we find that how Jesus felt at home at Simon's house. We are looking at verse 30 and 31. The word of God says, Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with fever. Okay, there are some versions that say high fever. Okay, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand and helped her up. The fever left her and she began to wait on them. Now, these two verses are very loaded. There's a lot of action happening there. And Matthew is packing a lot of things into just two simple lines or three simple lines. But let's unpack it and understand what are the steps, how Jesus enjoyed feeling at home in Simon's house. So the first thing that Mark tells us is that they immediately told Jesus about her. When you are facing with something that is out of your control, don't wait. Take it to Jesus. Take it to Jesus right away. I would say that even if you think you can control something, the best thing to do is to take it to Jesus and that's how you make him feel home in your life and in your homes. Jesus has to be a part of everything that we do. If you and I want to invite Jesus into our lives and make him feel at home in our lives, then he's got to be involved in everything. And when he's involved in everything, you'll find that he takes lead in everything. And that's the best place to be. Just imagine how your life would turn out if Jesus were to lead every single thing in your life. That's how we make Jesus feel at home. Jesus wants to bring, wants you and me to bring our concerns to him. He wants to help us. He wants to guide us. He wants to encourage us. He wants to be a part of every area of our life so that he can have his way and he can bless us to become a blessing. The word of God says that he went to her bedside. Jesus then went to her. That's what the word of God says. You know, in this case, she didn't go to Jesus. You know, throughout the gospel, you'll find that people are coming to Jesus. But here is an instance when Jesus goes to be with Simon's mother-in-law. He went to her. And that's what happens when Jesus feels at home in our lives. You know, when Jesus feels at home, he has every permission, he has every authority in our life to do whatever he wants with you and me. You know, there are times in our lives when Jesus would just show up and does everything on our behalf. You know, others may have prayed for us, but when we were in such a state that Jesus comes to us in our time of need and he does something spectacular, Jesus is feeling at home with you. When Jesus does not have to take your permission, Jesus feels at home with you. Well, Jesus not only goes to her, he takes her by the hand. Jesus could have simply said a word from the other room and she could be healed. The fever could be gone. But instead, Jesus goes to where she is. And the word of God says, he took her by her hand. Now that's some personal touch, isn't it? This tells us volumes about what Jesus is like and how much he loves us. This is what Jesus wants to do with you and me. And with those who do not know him and with those who do, he wants to give all of us a touch of his grace, a touch of his love. Maybe right now, Jesus is waiting for you to allow him to feel at home in your life. I don't know what walls you have created for Jesus to feel like a guest in your home. And not feel at home. If you allow, if you make Jesus a part of your life, and if he feels at home, your life will turn upside down. And it will be a wonderful life. Mark goes on to tell us that Jesus took her by the hand and he helped her sit up. Some translations would say, raised her up. Now the Greek word for helped her sit up, or to raise her up is a word called egirem. I hope I have spelled it right. 
uh, pronounce it right. It's called Egiren, E G E I R E N, and which will be used again by Mark when he describes Jesus raising a little girl from the dead in Mark chapter 5 and verse 41 42. And Mark will also again use it to describe Jesus' resurrection. Egiren. Jesus helped her sit up. In each case, it is God's power that makes these miracles possible. And this in many ways is a foreshadow of all that is to come. So Jesus goes to her and he lifts her up and then the fever leaves. After Jesus took her by the hand and raised her up, we are told that the fever left her. The healing was immediate, just like at the synagogue an hour or probably two earlier. Jesus had commanded an evil spirit to come out of the man and it did. That same authority and power was now being applied to Simon's mother-in-law for the fever to get out. Whether in the spiritual realm or in the physical realm, whenever Jesus issued a rebuke, the effects were immediate. And how immediate was it? Well, Mark says, the fever left her, she got up and she prepared a meal for them. In some translation says she began to serve them or wait on them. But this is something we got to be clear. She was completely healed. Her symptoms were gone. There was no recovery period. One moment she had been too weak to do anything but lie down. The next she was on her feet, full of energy, ready to help prepare the dinner or the lunch. It was as if they, she had never been sick. We are told that she began to prepare a meal and serve them. Even though this healing demonstrates the authority of Jesus over the physical world and its sickness, it also illustrates what our response should be when God heals us or when God blesses us or when God breaks into our life with something amazing like this. It challenges what our response should be when Jesus touches us with his hand of salvation, his hand of love, his hand of mercy. This miracle reveals that God meets us at the point of our need so that we may serve him and we may serve others. But it all starts with Jesus coming home and it continues as Jesus begins to feel at home in our lives. How often has God touched our lives and then we don't do anything with that blessing or that opportunity? That's a very, very sad place to be. When God has done the unthinkable and we would not respond to God in love. Thirdly, Jesus comes home, Jesus feels at home and thirdly, Jesus makes our home into his home. You know, Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. I'm sure after that they ate lunch, talked about what happened at the synagogue with the demon-possessed man, probably talked about healing Peter's mother-in-law and probably, you know, these uh, two sets of brothers, they had so many questions and probably they discussed the events and some of the things that are, you know, were connected about the kingdom of God. And then the afternoon moves on and then Mark begins to tell us in verse 32. It says, what happened that evening after sunset? So let's look at verse 32. It says, that evening after sunset, people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon possessed. The whole town gathered at the door and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. So Jesus does this amazing thing. You know, he heals Peter's mother, a mother-in-law. And after that, as they grab lunch, they're just sitting down and chatting. Imagine the talk about the wild scene at the synagogue. Probably they had a good laugh. You know, they shook their heads in amazement. And of course, they should have, should have discussed about how Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. I mean, 
Would you not? And I'm guessing the kingdom of God was also a part of that. They were still trying to pick up the pieces, understand what is this kingdom? But then, as time goes by, that evening after sunset, which was the Sabbath day, when Sabbath was over, and as soon as it was sunset, people started coming. Now when we look at this, there are two things that we got to focus on. There are two things that really happened. One is that the blessing that came to Simon Peter's house got multiplied. Blessings were multiplied. And the second thing that happened was power of Jesus was magnified. So let's look at the first part. Blessings were multiplied. Look at the things that Mark tells us. People brought to Jesus all the sick and demon possessed. Well, if you are not able to understand what does the word all mean, he further helps us to understand. Mark says, the whole town gathered at his door. Now suddenly all becomes a big number. And Jesus, and then he says, Jesus healed many who had various diseases. The whole idea here that I want to really point out is that the blessing that came to Jesus, to Simon Peter's home, now is multiplied because Jesus was feeling at home in Simon Peter's house, starts conducting his affairs from Simon Peter's home. Just imagine if you and I open our homes to Jesus, if you and I make him feel at home in our life, our home will turn into his branch office where he could have his affairs from. Jesus would conduct his ministry from our homes. Our home would become a center of healing, of blessing. Jesus had many, many, many people came and Jesus blessed them and healed them. The second thing that happened was his power was magnified. He also drew out many demons, they say, but he also told them, don't speak. And so many people experienced the power of God. And what started with one evil, one man with an evil spirit in the synagogue, that one incident led to Jesus coming to Simon Peter's house and now the entire town was experiencing his power, his blessing, his authority. The events in that one day demonstrated Jesus' incredible authority over the physical effects of sin. It also highlighted the supernatural nature of Jesus' sovereign power. When Jesus confronted either demons or the disease, they both fled at his command. Now that's a kind of power and might and authority. An undeniable proof of who Jesus is. He was surely God in human form. As the savior of the world, Jesus is able to rescue souls from both sin and Satan. As the resurrection and the life, Jesus has the restoring power over both the physical and the spiritual. As the redeemer, Jesus is able to redeem both the soul that is lost and the body that is decaying. Jesus was making his home at Simon's house. The kingdom indeed had come to Simon's house. When was the last time Jesus made his home at your place? He was not welcome at the synagogue. He was not completely at home in the synagogue. But he could make it to your home today. Maybe right now. We want to make Jesus comfortable in our church. But he is not interested in meeting you here. Jesus wants to come with you and me to our homes this day. And he wants to come and be a part of our lives. Be a part of our lunch plans. Our plans after that. He wants to be involved in everything you and I do. So that when he feels at home with our lives, our homes, our home becomes his home. What would it take? for us to give Jesus 
his rightful place in our life. Shall we bow down our heads and close our eyes and look to the Lord in prayer. Father Lord, we want to thank you Lord that you are not a God who is out there. Truly Lord, you are God Emmanuel. You are a God who wants to be with us, in us, work in us and work through us, O oh Lord Master. And Lord, we are very sorry for the many, many times Lord, when our lives and our lifestyles and our choices have prevented you, have not allowed you to be at home in our lives. In fact, many times, Lord, we have not even invited you to our homes. Lord, we are sorry for that. Forgive us, Lord. Lord, we invite you, Lord, today into our lives, into our homes. And Lord, we want to make you feel as comfortable as you can in our home, O Master. That you will have the final say, that you will have the rightful place in our home. And Lord, we ask you and we offer you, Lord. Lord, use us. Use us in our lives. Use our struggles. Use our victories. May your name be glorified. For we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Friends, Jesus desires us, He desires our lives, our homes, our challenges, our struggles, our victories, our celebrations, our parties, our fellowship, everything. 
God wants to be a part of all that. The question is, will we invite him? Make him feel at home and allow him to make our home his home. And now, unto him who is able to keep us from falling and present us faultless at the throne of grace, may the blessing of God the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit rest and abide with us now I mean, even as we go back home that he will abide with us and in our homes now and forevermore and all of God's people said Amen Amen